Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar presentation, The Gift of Self-Care Recovery in the Holiday Season. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Erin Byerly, and I am your Alumni Services Coordinator, and I'll be your moderator for today's online presentation. I'm so happy that we're going to be taking some time today to talk about self-care and recovery before getting into the busy holiday season. And before I introduce you all to today's presenter, Jacqueline Wise Saidi, I do want to go over a few announcements and give others a little bit of extra time to join. So we want to remind you all there is still time to register for our upcoming alumni webinar in December. We'll be hearing about the ways to create an inner sense of well-being by really being in our body um, during this presentation. So you can check out our events page on renfrewcenter.com and register for this upcoming webinar and any other upcoming events or webinars that might be of interest to you. We are also still hosting our residential alumni support group monthly with the next meeting scheduled for Tuesday, December 12th from 4 until 5 p.m. And we'll be keeping this up next year starting on Tuesday, January 16th. In addition, we also are still offering our weekly BIPOC and SAGE outpatient groups, and we've also added a virtual outpatient group specifically for college students. So if you're looking for more specific support kind of related to your life and recovery, you can always reach out to 1-800-RENFREW and learn more about these groups and other offerings we have. All of our events you can find listed on the events page at renfrewcenter.com and register for them there. So definitely check it out and see what's of interest to you. And as always, if at any point in time you feel like you need more support, please call, give us a call at 1-800-RENFREW or email us at alumni at renfrewcenter.com. Following this webinar, we would love to have your feedback. So you will be receiving an evaluation form via email that's very easily completed online. It's really helpful to get these evaluations back because it helps us kind of understand what's working, what doesn't work and design new programs to better assist you all in your recovery. We'll be doing question and answers at the end of Jacqueline's webinar. Um, you can submit questions at any point in time during the webinar by typing them into the question and answer function. We'll hold off though on answering questions until the end. I would now like to introduce you all to today's presenter. <clears throat> Jacqueline Wise Sid is a licensed psychologist and clinical education specialist at the Renfrew Center. Prior to this role, she served as the team leader at the Renfrew Center of Pittsburgh and received her doctoral degree in clinical psychology at the University of Denver Graduate School of Professional Psychology and completed her specialization in acceptance and commitment therapy. Jacqueline completed her doctoral internship training at the University of Pittsburgh Counseling Center with an area of concentration in sexual assault recovery. Since joining Renfrew in 2017, Dr. Wise has supported Renfrew Center of Pittsburgh staff in delivering evidence-based practice via the Renfrew Center Unified Treatment Model for Eating Disorders while integrating relational cultural theory, which promotes growth fostering relationships. And we're so glad we have this relationship with Jacqueline, who I will now turn it over to. Hi everyone, thank you for having me. My internet is acting up today. So if you leave me, if, if my screen pops off, I'll be right back. Um, we're going to be talking about self-care today and how that can be a tool to support yourself in recovery this holiday season. And when you think about self-care, I imagine some of those images come to mind of physical self-care, the things like showering or um, getting your nails done, you know, some of those things that are taking care of your, your physical body. But I think of self-care in a broader um, definition. So that one of the definitions here is the practice of taking an active role in protecting one's own well-being and happiness in particular during periods of stress. 
So that's not just your physical wellness, but your emotional well-being, your spiritual well-being, and your physical well-being in a holistic sense. So as you encounter stressors related to the holiday, think how what would be my, me taking an active role in protecting my own well-being. And so we're going to use that guideline of protecting your well-being and having a role in that as we look in different strategies in navigating the holidays. There can be so much stress around this time of year. You know, for one, you're out of your routine. So you might be traveling to different places, um, traveling where the food might be different, traveling to, to stay with family, which then could encounter some difficult relationships or relationships with um, an emotional history, people you haven't seen in a long time or who haven't seen you. You may be in an environment where folks comment on bodies or you're concerned that your body would be commented on or people are talking about their own bodies, which when you combine that with a time of year where there's a lot of food, that's a tough combination. Um, when there are these richer meals and desserts, that can also bring up diet talk and um, where some people you're around might be saying, oh, I'm so bad for eating this or, or, or whatnot, but making comments that make it hard if you're trying to challenge yourself with um, some of these different meals around the holiday. Holidays also can come with grief if you've lost someone um, or grieving you know, a, a time of your life or a place in your life, that there can be um, a melancholy that comes with the holidays as well. Um, reactivation of trauma. If you have had some relational trauma within your family of origin, and then you're going back into difficult environments, that can put your body um, on edge and start to activate some of that fight or flight, fight, flight, freeze response in the moment. There are financial stressors that come along with traveling or having to take time off of work or having to buy gifts. This is a time that a lot of people feel spread really thin. And then if you're a student, it's exam time. Or if you work, there can be end of the year pressures. A lot of things are coming to a head in these last couple months of the year. Um, then there can also be isolation or loneliness is for various reasons. Sometimes you're not around um, family and friends for the holiday. Maybe you live far away from your support system. There can be a number of reasons that you might find yourself a little bit isolated and then seeing other people with their families and their support systems can create um, some space for loneliness to come up. So when I look at that list, I think, whew, Okay, that's a lot of stressors and a lot of emotions to potentially be grappling with. So taking this question of how do I take an active role in protecting my wellness when navigating these different stressors. So I'm going to go through tips for this and different tools. And at the end, we'll do an experiential exercise of practicing. I'm going through a mindfulness practice that could, that could help and then finally writing out a, a small version of a plan, maybe taking a note in your phone or jotting it down next to you, but identifying a potential stressor and writing out a plan. So the, the basics here, kind of the, the basics of self-care are taking care of some of those basic needs. The, um, the things that help set you up for success. So if if you normally take medication and all of a sudden you're out of your routine, it can be easy to miss medication doses, which could be another thing that adds to that stress pile. So setting alarms to help remind you to take any medication, um, allowing yourself to prioritize sleep. Maybe folks are hanging out late at night and you can tap out, <laughs> tap out a little early to be able to go home and get some of that sleep. Drinking water, pacing your plans, 
there can be a pressure to to pack in more visits and more places and visiting multiple people in one short trip that to, to try to maximize what feels most important um, to do with my time and how do I make enough time to really appreciate those things that you are able to do. And prioritizing meal times when your routine is disrupted and you might be visiting people um, or having an unusual schedule, meals can up that nourishment is another thing that helps you, your brain function as needed and helps give you some of the mental resources to deal with any stress that comes about. So uh, when, when in doubt, back to basics of keeping your wellness needs And another point is that uh, food and meals can be so emphasized. And that's not the most important thing about the holiday season. We may congregate around meals, but the meal itself isn't what's important. It's often the connections that you get to have, um, seeing people you haven't seen, having an opportunity to slow it down and connect with someone that you care about. So if you are having some anxiety ahead of the holidays, maybe giving yourself other things to intentionally look forward to. How, do, how can you best um, connect and enjoy the company of people around you? That kind of you know, takes the meals off the pedestal a little bit. So some ideas around that, planning a game night, making holiday crafts, that's my personal favorite. Um, connect with the family member over a shared hobby. If there's something someone in your family likes to do, um, watching holiday movies, reconnecting with someone you haven't seen in a while, maybe making a holiday playlist, um, planning things that can set you up for positive interactions and to fill your cup a little bit. What's enjoyable to you? And, uh, I think other people will be grateful that you, you know, made, took the initiative to make some of these plans. So try to think of what would be most fulfilling and have that be uh, a part of the holiday events. Another big piece here is communicate, communicating any needs you have in advance of the holidays. And so that is helping Set yourself up for success by requesting support um, before you even get into a situation or setting up some boundaries before you get in a situation. Sometimes that can look like finding your ally. Maybe that's a sibling, maybe that's a, a cousin or a specific parent, somebody who when you're in those family environments could uh, check in with you, uh, advocate for you, somebody that even if it's just an agreement that you're going to share a look, <laughs> that, that there's some connection there of you see me, you acknowledge me. And having that set up ahead of time so that you can feel a little bit more supported going into a situation that could be tough. And it's hard to communicate what you need um, sometimes. And so i outlining a specific strategy for communicating needs um, for a, an assertive communication skill. It comes from DBT and it's called Dear Man. And that's on the next slide. So this Dear Man is an acronym for describing the situation uh, that you're currently in expressing your feelings, so expressing what your emotions are about the situation, asserting your needs respectfully, clearly stating them so that it's clear to the other person in the conversation, reinforce the helpfulness of the request. Why is it in everyone's best interest <laughs> to meet the request? And then that's the uh, what to do, and the man is the how. So 
the how being mindful of sticking to the goal of the conversation. It's not a time to try to talk through everything that's happened in the past or being mindful of your emotions during the situation, um, that you are, you're there with a specific goal. So trying to calmly and consistently, if the conversation is getting off um, on a tangent, gently bringing it back. Appearing confident in making your request. And part of that gets to clear communication. You are clearly asking for something as a result of this communication strategy. And negotiating if needed. If what you're asking for is not fully possible from this person you are requesting from, going into the conversation thinking, what might I be willing to compromise on? If I needed to negotiate here, what, where, could, where, where do I feel comfortable negotiating and what's a really hard boundary for me? So I'm going to give a couple examples of using this assertive communication to help set boundaries ahead of the holidays. Next, okay. So here's an example. If somebody in your in where you're going in your household or your extended family makes body comments, um, here's an example. In the past, when I came home for the holidays, someone would comment on if I have gained or lost weight. This makes me feel self-conscious and uncomfortable. I would really appreciate it if no one commented on my body when I come home for break. I will feel happier at coming home and more present to all of our fun plans if we can agree to this. Then we can focus on the, on the, on the more important thing, getting to spend some time together. So in that um, paragraph, you're describing what happens has, when you come home for the holiday? You're in a situation where people have commented on your weight. You're expressing that it doesn't, it makes you uncomfortable. You're asserting that you would appreciate if your body is not commented on. And then you're reinforcing it. Listen, I'll be happier to come home if I feel safe that no one's going to do this. Or if I feel comfortable that no one's going to do this. And I can focus on connecting rather than focus on being fearful if someone's going to comment on my body. So the, the man part of it, being mindful of the topic of what you're asking for now versus getting stuck in the details from the past. So if the person you're talking to says, but... Da, da, da. <laughs> but we were concerned about you, but we're worried about your health. But, you know, whatever reason a person gets to say, I understand that. And I'm asking for this time when I come home and in the future, please don't comment on my body. That you're not trying to argue about what has or hasn't happened. If they're disagreeing with the past, they could still disagree with the past. If they're agreeing that moving forward, they will not comment on your body. Appearing confident that that you're asking for this need directly, um, that's pretty clear. Please don't comment on my body. And if a person agrees that no one in the, say you're talking to your mom and your mom says, okay, I'll talk to your dad. No one's gonna make a comment on your body. Maybe the negotiation is, is if your mom says, but I can't control what your great aunt Becky says, uh, I'll try to intercede if I can. The, the negotiation may be acknowledging, okay, my mom might not be able to prevent every single person in the family from saying something, but I can at least get that agreement to my boundary from my immediate family. Um, so of course this would be in your own words. And if this sounds really um, kind of unnatural to you, you can take this same outline, describe, express, assert, reinforce, and put it in your own words. How do you speak within your family? And maybe for some folks, this is more direct than you tend to be because we have different families with different family cultures. And um, some, some of our family cultures might have more passive or passive aggressive communication. And so this would be a shift. Um, and you don't necessarily control how the other person will respond, but this gives you a clear pathway on how you can respond and anchor in that response uh, as you go through that mindfully bringing it back to the point. So that's an example for body comments. We have another one that we can look at next. 
food comments. Okay. So here is another communication example. I know you might be concerned about restriction around the holidays since I recently left IOP and I'm still working on my recovery. When anyone makes comments on my plate, it makes me feel even more anxious about the meal. In that moment, I'm already trying to ground myself if I'm approaching a fear food. When I'm home for the holiday, please don't comment on what I'm eating. I made a plan with my treatment team and I already have a plan going into these big meals. When you trust me to make a plan and follow through with it, I feel more at ease in our relationship. You showing me trust helps me to build confidence as I do this on my own. So describing that you're leaving IOP and you know your parents might still be, or your loved one might still be nervous, but expressing that when you feel policed or um, overly watched, that it makes it even harder. Asserting that you got a plan and you just need them to let you do your plan and reinforcing that the relationship improves when they're able to give you space to follow through on your own goals. Being mindful of keeping it focused on the present. So the person may bring up meals you've struggled at in the past, but you can calmly reorient the conversation to the present. Um, appearing confident, you're direct, this is what you're asking for. And negotiating. So what if your parent says, what do you, what do I do if I do believe you've restricted? And if if this is still something you're actively struggling with, maybe negotiate that they can bring it up with you in private after the meal, but that not to be monitoring and making comments during mealtime in front of other family members where that makes it even more difficult. So maybe that's a negotiation you're okay with and maybe it's not. And that's a personal choice as far as going into these tough conversations, um, knowing for yourself what would be helpful or not. Again, these are just some suggestions on how to have a conversation like this because um, it can be anxiety provoking to you know, directly state your needs if that hasn't been something that you've been in a pattern of doing. So you've gotten skills up until this moment, I'm sure from a variety of places and going through Renfrew, maybe in your outpatient therapy, maybe from a book you've read, um, that you already have a toolbox going into the moment. And when we practice skills, uh, when you're not elevated, when you practice them at baseline, they're more accessible to you when you're in times of stress. So the more you practice things just right now leading up to the event, the more easily you'll be able to reach for that skill and use it automatically if you're in a moment of struggle. So some of those different skills might be doing an arc of emotions, doing a three-point check, checking into your emotional experience, anchoring in the present. So breathing and sinking your feet into the ground and trying to pull your thoughts to what is happening right now in this moment, instead of all the stories about the future or the memories about the past that can kind of cycle in our minds. Identifying thinking traps, identifying when our thoughts are getting um, swept away, practicing reappraisals, uh, how can you be flexible with your thoughts and practicing that flexibility over and over again so that they're ready for you right when you try to think of them. Planning for alternative actions. So recognizing what else can I do in those situations when I might struggle. Playing out the tape. And this can kind of be thought of as an arc in your head, uh, planning out, okay, if I do this, if I do use a behavior, what will happen next and what will happen next? Okay, like, is that an outcome I want or is it, or is it not? And do I wanna use an alternative action? Remind yourself of previous moments of doing hard things. Identify your values. What is most important to you about the holidays? Um, and trying to make steps that take you toward those values. That kind of gets, gets back to our non-food holiday slide. If the most important time is to be able to see your sibling, okay, then, then make that a focus of the trip of really getting to connect um, with someone you care about. 
All right, that's we're going to go through an example of an arc for the holidays just to help recognize how this could play out utilizing the self-care of how do you take care of yourself in the moment. So the antecedent, um, it's late at night, your family members are going to bed is the immediate situation. Earlier, you had a bigger meal. The house was tense after two families got an argument. Dessert, even though you were craving it. You felt anxious before even coming home. And then there's been a history of tense family interactions or walking on eggshells. So you feel kind of a tightening in your body when you even think about going home. So while it's late at night, the emotional response in the moment I've been thinking about that pie in the kitchen since dinner. I've had such a good streak. I really don't want to binge. I just want to be home in my own house with my pets and away from this conflict. And in your body, you check into physical sensations and notice a pit in your stomach. Feelings of restlessness, feeling your heart rate speed up. And you have an urge to binge or an urge to drink just to to kind of zone out from the conflict, tune out from it. And what you ultimately end up doing is texting your friend to talk about your night. Maybe you even gave a friend a heads up that you may need to text them if family interactions get tense. So that is in that moment, protecting your own well-being by looping into some support. In the short term, you're still sitting with some anxiety from witnessing that tense interaction. And some restlessness too, it's really normal for your body to have that response when there's tension. You also felt some relief for being able to connect with a friend. In the long term, uh, by making those kind of choices over time, you're learning to ride out the urges to, to, to use behaviors and realize that the urges eventually come down. You feel more connected with your friends if you open up to them during moments of vulnerability. You're building a response that feels sustainable. If you can't make it so that there's not tension in your family, you're learning to deal with that tension in a way that doesn't cause you more harm. So an arc could be something you write out after the fact to give yourself kind of credit for how you managed it or to learn from if you feel like you managed a situation uh, in a way that didn't align with what your goals are, then you can see what you can learn from an arc. You can also um, arc in advance, and that's the next slide. So an arc in advance is, say there is a, a common thing that happens that is hard um, when you're around the holidays, and you, already, you can already anticipate, uh-oh, I'm probably gonna run into this situation again. So we're doing an arc where we're imagining a situation here. So an antecedent, sitting down for a large family meal, and a relative has been talking about their diet. And there's multiple fear foods on your plate. Maybe your history is that you have family members that consistently talk about their diets, no matter what you've tried to do to intervene. Earlier, you asked your sibling to change the subject if diet talk comes up during the meal. Maybe you've been pushing yourself in recovery, but there's a history of it's always harder when you go home. And maybe you've been having a hard couple of months at work. So what, what, do you, what might you think in that situation? What might be going on in, with your thoughts? So this is a lot of food. I don't know all the ingredients in this. Why are they talking about their diet? Are they judging what I'm eating? And then you might feel warm, sweaty, headache, clammy hands, nauseous, and there's an urge to restrict. So using the, the frame of self-care or how can I best care for my well-being, what do I do in this moment to best tend to my emotions and the situation? So trying to think for your brain to brainstorm for yourself, what would I do? And so the next slide we have, Kind of an answer to that. What would I do? You're kind of planning out how you'd handle. It. So the first antecedent and the is slide is or section is the same, and the response section is the same till we get down to behaviors. Here's some options. Ask a different question that changes the topic. 
anchor in the moment by taking some breaths and slowing yourself down. Practice some reappraisal statements to yourself in your mind and finish them. So if that's how you handle it, some of the short-term consequences, feeling some relief for the topic changing, some anxiety remaining about um, challenging yourself with the meal, and maybe also some feelings of empowerment from making a recovery choice in a difficult situation. In the long term, if you're able to respond to these type of situations with those actions, you'd have an increased ability to tolerate emotions when feeling triggered and an improved ability to be flexible when ED thoughts show up. That you, you know, we can't always control what thoughts are popping up in our mind, but you're developing uh, different ways to respond when they do. So this could be a way to enter a situation feeling a little more prepared when you have already thought through, okay, if that, if situation A happens, I know what I'm going to do. So this could be something you do on your own or talk to somebody in your treatment team about, but helping yourself already have a plan laid out. Go to the next slide. The next slide is about automatic appraisals. So those thoughts or judgments or beliefs that automatically pop in your head. You don't even have to try to think about them. They just show up and um, they may show up really quickly. If you've been struggling with this uh, for a long time, then even if you don't you know, use behaviors anymore, there could still be times when the thoughts are showing up really quickly and those, shot, those thoughts show up with some distress. So here's some examples of possible automatic appraisals. And maybe it's for you, it's totally different and that is okay. These were just some that... Um, some practice tools. So some automatic appraisals might be, I'm going to need to make up for this tomorrow. They will notice my body has changed. This is too much food. I can't be around this later or I'm going to binge. They're judging what I put on my plate. So we could think about any of those uh, thoughts that show up in the moment and bring some distress. And our tool for automatic appraisals is sometimes with mindfulness, you can acknowledge them and let them pass. Um, oh, that's a that's an eating disorder thought. That's an automatic appraisal. Uh, just see that as something that your mind is doing and let that that thought keep keep it moving. But sometimes they're really sticky and they they're hard to just acknowledge and move through. And I think that is when reappraisals can be particularly helpful is specifically practicing how do I be flexible with that thought? How do I hold more than one thought at once and encourage some more balanced thinking? So on our next slide, we have some examples of reappraisals for these automatic appraisals. So I'm going to need to make up for this tomorrow. And my rule is always do at least two reappraisals. We want our reappraisals to overpower some of these automatic appraisals over here. So as many thoughts as you can that you could consider alongside those automatic appraisals. So some other thoughts that could coincide, every day is a new day. I don't need to make up for or earn food. Eating consistently helps keep me on track. And check in with yourself on how you feel how emotionally, how you feel in your body when you tell yourself, I'm going to need to make up for this tomorrow versus when you tell yourself every day is a new day. That there may even be a, a physical response that changes with those two lines of thinking. Automatic appraisal, I'll notice my body has changed reappraisals. People are more concerned with their own bodies than mine. My body is the least interesting thing about me. 
bodies are always changing. This doesn't change my worth. Automatic appraisal, this is too much food. <laughs> Reappraisal, it's normal to have larger meals and different foods around the holidays. My body uses the fuel I give it. Automatic appraisal, I can't be around this later or I'm going to binge. Reappraisals, practicing being around binge foods helps take their power away. I can allow myself to have foods I'm craving. I can eat it with someone else. It's okay to be anxious. I have tools I can use to help me through the moment. Automatic appraisal, they're judging what I put on my plate. Reappraisals, it's not anyone's business what I'm eating. People are preoccupied with their own meals. If someone makes a comment that is more about their own beliefs than me, I don't have to own it. So your reappraisals could be totally different. And that's great. And a reappraisal doesn't have to just be an opposite statement to the first, but other thoughts that could expand your thinking. If your brain is latching on really hard to the automatic appraisal, we're trying to open it up. What else could exist? What could exist alongside it? What else could be true to try to help insert some ease and flexibility? So for you, these automatic appraisals might be different, but this still might be a nice exercise to write out some reappraisals and rehearse them, help them be accessible to you because that first thought's probably gonna be pretty accessible. It's gonna show up pretty quick. So helping practice those reappraisals. Next slide. I, uh, I think you can never underestimate the power of slowing down. Um, slowing down your reactions, slowing down. Sometimes I even have to slow down how fast I'm talking, right? Um, that many situations can be helped by creating a pause between our emotions and our responses. Um, there is something about being in certain environments that can just press our buttons. Um, and so when you are in those environments, noticing when your buttons have been pressed, if somebody, if somebody says something that bristles against you, maybe the first thing to do is to stop and take a breath before you respond in any way that, that to slow down and recognize when those emotions come up, that we're constantly moving through the world and having emotional reactions and some we're more aware of than others. But when someone really um, and it irritates us, that emotion goes, whew. Um, so being able to recognize when those emotions happen. Taking a break from the situation or environment. Maybe that looks like walking the dog, going to make a phone call. Uh, if something was forgotten at the grocery store, maybe you're the one that's going to go take a run. Um, taking a shower, taking a nap. If you feel like you're in a tense environment, an anxiety evoking environment, if you need a break to help regulate your emotions and your reactions, take a break. Um, if that's what you need to be able to access a skill um, or to help yourself move through that emotion, do it. Um, I think that can be part of what's hard about traveling is that feeling of needing to be on all the time <laughs> where I, we can really benefit from a moment to slow down. Some specific ways to do that could be square breathing or box breathing. That's the anchoring skill of breathing into the count of four, holding to the count of four, out to the count of four, holding to the count of four, but using those counted breaths as a way of taking care of your overall well being. Help yourself slow down. Give them time to decide what you want to do with whatever the emotion is. A three-point check is asking yourself about the three components of emotion. What am I thinking? What am I noticing in my body? What am I doing or having the urge to do? Um, but you could do that while closing your eyes and breathing. You could do that just mentally. Or you could write it out. If it helps to physically write out maybe a note in your phone of what's your point check, anything that helps you um, to slow down. 
to create room for the emotion to rise and fall. Next slide. Flexibility in the face of perfectionism. We've been talking about all the stressors that can come with the holidays. And I think another thing that can heighten those emotions is pressure. Pressure that we might put on ourselves, pressure that other people might put on us, but maybe feeling like you have or having high standards for your recovery or how you look in certain situations or the pressure to um, be perfect and for everyone to be happy. And I, and um, I used to work at the Pittsburgh Renfrew Center and some of the clients used to say around this time of year, you know, what's another name for Thanksgiving? a Thursday. <laughs> and there was kind of a like a tongue in cheek way of saying that these days are just a day. And when we build them up and we can pressure for them to go perfectly and for ourselves to manage perfectly, that I think it can make it even harder. And so I put a couple of questions here of what is good enough? That, you know, what is good enough effort? <laughs> what is um, progress enough? How can I be gentle with myself if things aren't going exactly uh, as I'd hoped? Um, how can I um, allow myself some grace and take the next step that I wanna take? Um, basically being willing to accept imperfection um, and recognize that you're, you're doing your best and that Self-criticism uh, doesn't need to be another thing that, that makes this time of year even harder. I mentioned grief earlier too, and that making space for grief around the holidays if you have lost someone, um, that it's okay to talk about. And maybe that can look like making a plan to share with someone if you're feeling grief. Maybe that is if there's if you've lost someone and you want to talk to someone else that knew them to do that or to tell stories about them to a person who didn't know them, but to basically describe or share about this person that was meaningful to you. You could bring them meaningfully into the celebration things like lighting a candle for them. Some people do a place setting or saying, you know, words of remembrance at mealtime, but, but acknowledging that loss. Maybe that's writing your loved one a letter, or maybe it's allowing yourself to feel, allowing yourself time and space to cry or honor your relationship and to let that grief come in that, that it's not something to be avoided. It's actually something that helps um, honor how much you cared about that person in your life. And when things are tough, that self-compassion can also be a tool. Um, Kristen Neff defines self-compassion as having three components, mindfulness, common humanity and kindness. Mindfulness meaning bringing attention to your emotions as they are in the moment. Common humanity, recognizing that all of our pain is part of what it means to be human and that everyone has feelings of inadequacy and difficult emotions and that using those to connect us to the human experience rather than to isolate us. And kindness, speaking to ourselves as we would a friend. So in previous webinars uh, or uh, IG lives, you might've heard me do a self-compassion break because I love self-compassion work. So I'm gonna do a different one today, which is the reign of self-compassion. Tara Brock is a mindfulness a meditation teacher. And one of her practices is the RAIN plan, so recognize what is going on, allow the experience to be there as it is, investigate with interest and care, and nurture with self-compassion. So 
if you're willing to take just a couple minutes to practice one of these reign of self-compassion exercises, you can type reign of self-compassion into Google and, uh, and in multiple YouTube videos will come up, but I can also walk you through one right now. So if you're feeling willing to give this a, give this a practice right now, sit in your chair, um, with enough space for your air, for your lungs to really get some air. You can close your eyes or gaze softly ahead. Taking a deep breath and letting it out. Taking another deep breath. And then letting your body settle into its natural breathing. Taking a moment to recognize what's going on, acknowledging any feelings that are affecting you right now. Simply turning toward what you're feeling. Allow that experience to be there just as it is. You don't have to fix it or avoid it. You don't have to agree or disagree. Whatever's showing up, it's okay. Imagine yourself making space in your body to contain whatever thoughts and emotions are arising right now. And as you are recognizing and allowing emotions, investigate them with interest and care. You might ask yourself, what wants attention in my emotions right now? How am I experiencing this in my body? do I most need? As you've acknowledged emotions and investigated them with care, nurture with self-compassion. And that could look like putting your hand over your heart or your hand on your cheek. Imagining yourself nurturing that part of you that's hurting. Maybe you're offering reassurance, companionship, love, Maybe saying to yourself something like, I'm here for you. I'm listening. If it's hard to connect with this, maybe imagine another loving figure 
like a family member or a friend or a pet, imagining there that being's love and wisdom flowing into you. another couple of breaths, allowing for some space and slowness. And then bringing your awareness back to the Zoom today. And this was a quick version but could be applied to anything that you might be struggling with. Recognizing the emotion, allowing it to be there, investigating it and trying to see what the need is there, and then offering kindness and compassion for whatever that need is. Um, so I would recommend Googling this if you want to listen to her fuller, full longer version of this um, mindfulness practice. But maybe this is also something that you could use if you're trying to take a pause from your environment. Next slide. So I'll... many of the things we've been talking um, about today culminate in making a plan. So recognizing, maybe even taking and putting a note in your phone right now for what's a concern you have, what are two different skills you could use, who could you ask for support, how could you create a pause, and what can help you remember that this tough moment will pass. So this is just a mini plan, um, but maybe there's maybe when you maybe there was something on your mind when you signed up for this webinar that you were worried about over the over the holidays, and maybe that's something you can identify in your plan. And if you need to even take a picture of this slide with your phone, if you want to be able to think about this plan more after the webinar, yeah, go ahead and take a picture. And then we'll I, um, move on to a final reminder that you're not alone. Maybe you have a friend date set up for when you get back or after the holidays have passed um, to have a debrief with a friend or you text someone or you have, you know, your, uh, your appointments and a treatment team have those sessions set up um, for either now before holidays or after to have a place to land and there's always the crisis help number 988 if you need it as well um but that it's okay to utilize every resource at your disposal and then i think we have a couple minutes for questions yes we do jacqueline which i'm so happy about because i feel like this is such a timely i mean conversation to be having I I keep forgetting that Thanksgiving is next week <laughs> and I feel like it, you know, the, like the months are just flying by and I think being able to take that break and and I loved you just asking of like to take a breath take a moment because so often we get to, kind of so focused on well, I need to do this I need to do this I need to do this um that we kind of forget like we also need to just breathe just relax and breathe. Um, so as we said, please continue to put any questions you have in the chat. But one I kind of wanted to start out with, Jacqueline, was just like, you talked about using Dear Man, using those assertive communication um, techniques. What do we do though, if we've done that, maybe our families has even agreed, but then they're still making comments or not doing what we asked them to do, even though we've kind of heard from them that they are willing to do it. Oh, and I might have lost you. Oh, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think that you can reassert those boundaries. People may need reminders. And I know that's frustrating. And I know you like, it makes sense. 
um, to to want folks to respect those boundaries, but to offer a gentle reminder, or if it keeps happening and it's really troublesome to you, um, part of the the dear man communication strategy that we didn't get into is you know what to do if those consistently aren't followed, if your request isn't met. And for some people, it may be worth saying, if you cannot respect this boundary, I'll need to leave, like I'll need to go home or I'll need to take space. Mm -hmm. um, basically what you will do if that cannot be met. And so depending on the severity, there may be situations where you I, you identify that the most healthy thing for you or the most self-care move is to remove yourself from a situation. Mm -hmm. And my hope is that with assertive communication on the front end, that can be uh, prevented as much as possible, but also acknowledging where those limits lie. And maybe for some people in some situations, there are times when it's, um, you might need to step away. Yeah. In those situations when we do have to step away, I imagine, you know, the could likely be feelings of guilt any ideas or like thoughts on like how do we how do we handle and kind of work on tolerating that guilt mm -hmm. it's hard to learn that it's okay to stand up for yourself <laughs> it really is and I think that's where self-compassion comes in I think that's also where connecting with supports that do validate your needs that do wish you to have uh, emotional safety and comfort and will will reassure you that it's okay to assert those things maybe it's also having um, kind of allies in your family where you can where you don't have where you can still maintain connections um, with the people who can respect those boundaries for you. Um, and I think that it's it's kind of a, it's not gonna be a one time of reassurance and the guilt goes away, but a, a building a relationship with yourself where you're validating your own needs often enough that you're um, reinforced in, in learning that that's okay. Yeah, that validation, I feel like is such an important piece of like, okay, like I'm, a, I'm allowed to set these boundaries. A lot of us might have gotten, you know, messages either directly or indirectly that no, you can't, like it's the holidays, you have to spend it with family. And that's not the reality, you know, if it's not helping us, we can validate, you know, this isn't helpful for me. Why, why am I continuing to put myself in a situation that I know is likely to harm me, you know? So having that validation, I feel like is so yeah. important. Yeah. What about, um... and I think that can also be where family with choice come in, where, where it's like, family of choice comes in. <laughs> Yeah, I um I was saying that who really does see you, honor you, honor your well being, and maybe those are some folks to connect with if you find that you um do not feel comfortable connecting with your own family at this time. Yeah, I love that idea. What about guilt around like if we do act on behaviors? Because you know you talked about this in the presentation. There are more experiences, more stressors. And so the likelihood that urges are gonna increase and we might not always be able to kind of just tolerate those urges without acting. How do we handle kind of our own repercussions or guilt from acting on those behaviors? Um, for, for that one, I would say that every day is a fresh start to honor what was going on for you at the time, um, that there was, you probably did that with the, we, we, we talk about antecedents for a reason. We list all those out to say, it makes sense that emotions get so tough. There's so many layers of stressors happening at one time. So to honor the antecedents, there was a lot on your plate. And that in the next day, in the next meal, you know, there's always a new opportunity to try something different, 
And maybe what you learned from that was that this particular environment was hard to navigate without a support, or that maybe you stayed too long and needed to leave, to leave earlier before, so you could go take that space for yourself. Or maybe you learned that the isolation was hard and you needed to make sure you have plans and somewhere to go, but that it's an opportunity to gain more information about the kind of supports you need. Mm -hmm. Well, Jacqueline, thank you so much. I know we're just at time. <clears throat> so if you all have more questions, please feel free to reach out to us at alumni at .com and we can get those over to Jacqueline. But on behalf of myself and the Renfrew Center Foundation, Jacqueline, I want to thank you so much for presenting today. And I want to thank all of our attendees for participating and attending today. And hopefully we'll see you all next month. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks so much for having me.